I'm going to step aside, Bob, if you want to have prayer for us. It's nice to see every one of you. It's not the best in the world to look at and see your faces with masks and covers on it because it's always beautiful to see your smiles. And we're glad that you're here. Let us bow our heads as we open our service. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we can come here and, and come and, and be with you on the Sabbath morning, which you have set before many years ago, set, set the time for us to have this time together as brothers and sisters to learn more about, about our Savior. We thank you for everyone that's present, and we pray that you be with us as we receive the word today. Thank you so much for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon this church and bless everyone that's here. And thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings. Thank you for whoever comes this morning. I'm not for sure who's doing the preaching, but we appreciate, Lord, that that, that person is available. And we thank you, Lord, too. And bless us with the good music that's, that's about to be given to us also. And we pray that you continue to bless us and keep us safe during this coronavirus. Bless our brothers throughout our world and throughout the church. And keep us close to thee, Lord. Help us to recognize that the Sabbath is still very important. And we're glad that everyone that's here is here. And bless those that have not arrived here yet. Thank you so much for your love for us, Lord. And for having to given your life at the cruel cross on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Today our mission story is coming from the country of Guinea. And it's about someone named Marie, and the story is entitled, Illiterate But Able to Read. Marie wasn't a Christian, but she kept dreaming about Jesus. She sacrificed a cow in hope that the dreams would end, but she was still disturbed every night for a week. Then a stranger directed her to the office of Jacob Gabali, president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Guinea. He worked just up the street from her lecturer's home in Conquery, capital of Guinea. As Marie described her dreams, Pastor Jacob began to smile. Glory be to God, he exclaimed. Marie was shocked. She couldn't understand why he was so happy. You don't need to make any more sacrifices, Pastor Jacob said, lifting up the Bible from his desk. God is calling you. I think your God has made a mistake, Marie said. I have always belonged to my family's religion. Jacob held out the Bible. This is your Bible, he said. What would I do with that Bible, Marie asked. I don't even know how to read. Pastor Jacob asked whether anyone in her family was literate, and she conceded that her cousin could read. Jacob wrote Marie's name inside the Bible. Take your Bible and go, he said. Marie was annoyed with Pastor Jacob, and she left without saying goodbye. Why do these people, who do these people think they are, she thought as she walked home. They tell me to read the Bible as if I don't know God. At home, Mary placed the Bible in the drawer and closed it. She wanted to relax. Turning on the television to her favorite channel, she saw a program about Jesus. Click. She changed the channel. The next channel also had a program about Jesus. Click. Another program about Jesus. Marie called her satellite television provider. What is wrong with your channels? She demanded. Every channel is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The male voice sounded puzzled. Everything is in order, he said. No, it's not that, Marie shouted. Come here and fix my TV. A short time later, a man arrived and flipped through the channels. Everything worked normally. Marie was speechless. Marie went to bed, but she couldn't stop thinking about Jesus. Then she remembered the Bible. The only way to stop thinking about Jesus would be to read it, she decided. In the morning, she asked her cousin to come over. What is this, she said, holding out the Bible. Tell me. Her cousin, Hamudu, Hamudu had studied at a Christian school in Syria, Leon, and he recognized the Bible. 
Who gave you that Bible, he said. I received it from a pastor, Murray said. What do you want to do with it, he said. You don't know how to read. Look, you went to school, she said. I want you to help me read this Bible. Teach me how to read. And Mu Mudu opened the Bible. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, he read. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He read until he reached the end of the Lord's Prayer. Are you happy, he asked. Murray asked him to underline the verses. Amadu laughed. He laughed so hard that he cried. You never went to school, he sputtered. How can you read? Yet he underlined the passage. Then he made Murray repeat it a dozen times so he would remember it. That evening, Murray picked up the Bible and found the Lord's Prayer. Even though she had never learned to read, she found that she was able to read it. She turned the page and, to her surprise, realized that she could read other verses as well. The next day, Marie couldn't wait to talk to Hamadou. You laughed at me yesterday, so let me show you that I can read, she said. No way, he said. Not even in your dreams can you read. Marie opened the Bible to a random page and read, Hamadou looked startled and then afraid. How did you do that? he asked. My cousin, that is human intelligence, Murray said with a smile. If you really believe that you are able to do something, you can do it. From that moment, Marie read the Bible every day. She later realized that it was Jesus who had given her the ability to read the Bible, and she gave her heart to him. The Seventh-day Adventist Church faces enormous challenges in spreading the gospel in Guinea, where only 7% of the population is Christian, and many people are hostile to Christianity. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help construct Kobaye Academy, a kindergarten through 12th grade school in Konkuri, Guinea, where the love of Jesus can be taught to many children from non-Christian homes. Good morning. It's time for a children's story, so uh, listen up, turn up your hearing aids or whatever else is necessary, and uh, listen to the story. First Timothy 6.10 The love of money is the root of all evil. I have a little tale here. It's a parable about money. Now, there were these three men who were really, really good friends. And they found a bag of gold. But as they found their money and they picked it up, they were walking along and they realized that they were really, really, really hungry. And they were weary from the day's journey. As they walked along, one of the friends said, I will go to town and look for a place that sells bread, and I will buy some bread. And you two stay here and guard the gold. But as he walked along, going to town to buy the bread, there was a thought that hatched in his brain. And he said, I will poison this bread. And then when my two friends eat it, they will die and I will have enough money to last me until I'm very, very old. But these two friends were sitting back there with that bag of gold, and they were looking at it, gazing at all that money, and all of a sudden, a thought came to their mind. And they said, let's kill our friend when he returns with the bread, and then we'll die, divide the money between ourselves. So, that's exactly what they did. When their friend got back, they killed him. Then, they ate that bread beside the gold. The two men who ate that poisoned bread, they died. And beside that bag of gold, three friends lay dead. What price they paid to get that bag of gold? Their virtue, friends, their very lives they sold. 
with love for gold, man's righteousness departs. Alas, the power of gold upon our hearts. Remember, the love of money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6.10 Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath to everyone. Now it's time for our congressional prayer. And for those who are able to, we ask that you uh, get on your knees at this time. Lord, kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we are able to be again in your house of worship. Maybe not all of us can be here who would like to be here. We're out for different reasons, Lord. Number one is the, the dilemma that is facing all of us, Lord. But we know that you are taking care and watching over each and every one of us, Lord. And while we may be apart, Lord, let us not forget the hope that is in you. Lord, and we pray right now for the sermon, Lord, that is going to be preached today, Lord. Let our hearts and minds be open and receptive to receive the blessing that you have for us. And Lord, that we can pass this on to others, Lord, in the life that we live. Thank you and continue to bless us throughout this whole day, I pray. In thy holy name, amen. From um, Cynthia and Andre Azevedo. They are visiting with us. We hope to make them regular members here. Uh, Andre is, uh, I believe, a student at the University of New Mexico in the music department. And they're going to bless us with their musical gifts. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Uh, the piece we're going to be playing today uh, is called My Tribute. And I especially like the beginning of the verse in the Spanish version. It says, Como agradecer? In how can I thank him who gave everything for me? So for me, every time I play this and I, I, I think about this, it's a time for reflection in the sacrifices that Jesus made for us.
Our scripture, scripture reading this morning is in Ephesians 4.32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for the music. That was a blessing. Brought some tears to my eyes. I appreciated that very much. That was exciting music. It has some drama to it, some feel to it. You know, the most sublime, the most wonderful music in the world is music that glorifies our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Heavenly Father. And, and we appreciate that, don't we? It's good to see everybody here today. Someone asked this morning who was preaching. And I said, tall, skinny guy with a lot of gray hair on top of his head. And he looked at me and he said, is that you? I said, I fit the description. But it is good to see everybody here, and uh, we're glad that you're with us today. Uh, before we start, let's have another quick prayer, and we'll jump right into our sermon today, which is called The Family of God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, it's a privilege to be here today in your sanctuary, in your church, to study your word together. And Lord, as we consider this very important topic, we ask that your spirit will open our minds and our hearts, help us to receive and put into practice the practical knowledge and teaching that you've given to us in your word. Thank you for your mercy and your love. Thank you for each person here. Thank you for all the talents that have been shared with us today and continue to bless us. You've given us a gift, this gift of the Holy Spirit. We were studying in Sabbath school this morning. Sometimes we laugh a little bit about re-gifting. Sometimes people give us a gift and we say, well, you know, I think I'll re-gift that gift. And Jesus wants us to re-gift the gift that he's given to us, eternal life, salvation. So, Lord, help us each one to re-gift what we learned today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A uh, quick update. Um, someone shared with us a video last night. It's from Pastor Doug Batchelor. Just a few days ago, he put out a new prophecy update. How many of y'all are familiar with the prophecy updates that Amazing Facts puts out occasionally? He felt uh, and it was important to put out a new prophecy update, and it has to do with some new news from the Vatican from the Pope. And uh, the Pope is up to it again. He is very interested in, in promoting what on outwardly is uh, an environmental agenda. Now, Seventh-day Adventists and Christians are, in a sense, in a real sense, Christian environmentalists doesn't mean that we're radical or that we're crazy. But the Bible says in the book of Revelation that God will come and destroy those who would destroy the earth. To say that another way in the modern language, we look after the environment, right? We make sure that things are clean. We don't throw out our trash. We do the best we can uh, in the environment in which we live to take care of God's creation, right? We believe that and we affirm that. But we also know that there is a radical aspect to it, which I think is dangerous. And the Pope is kind of using the uh, environmental agenda to promote something, which is something we should really pay attention to, and that is Sunday rest. There are many voices now that are coming out, and the Pope is certainly one of them, and they believe that if we just rested on a certain day, in other words, we didn't work, in other, in other words, if there wasn't a lot of economic activity or a lot of traveling around, a lot of football playing and hockey playing and basketball playing and those kinds of things, if there was just a day of rest, what would happen? Well, we're learning some of that with this pandemic that's going on right now. Because of the pandemic, there's not so much Traveling, right? Traveling has been greatly reduced. The consumption of gasoline has been greatly reduced. Now that's starting to rise back up. Economic activity has certainly been suppressed. And so as a consequence of that, places like Los Angeles and other major cities around the world are noticing that smog is decreasing, right? That uh, animals that used to be scared to cross the road, now they're crossing the highways because there's so much less traffic, those kinds of things. People are actually noticing that, and that's because there's a lot less human activity. So that kind of feeds into the narrative, well, maybe if we create a day of rest, and of course most people, Christians, believe that day of rest is the Sunday, and the Pope has said that, and he said it again very recently, 
then, uh, then it's better for the planet, it's better for everyone. So these are things we need to be paying attention to, the environmental crisis, and I believe other crises in the future, as brought out to us in God's word, and brought out to us uh, in the spirit of prophecy, tell us there are other things, signs to look forward to. Now, this past March, there was supposed to have been a grand education meeting at the Vatican, people from all over the world, from all different beliefs, people that were non-Christians and Christian faith, Protestants, Catholics, Muslims, Buddhists, they were all invited to the Vatican this past March, and they were going to discuss how to get some of this information out to the world. And of course, who is in charge? Who is the great teacher? The Pope himself. Uh, it didn't happen in March because of the pandemic. It may possibly happen in October. When did I say? What is, what is today? September. So it may be happening in October. That needs to be verified. If not, it's supposed to be happening pretty soon. So uh, we need to be attuned to these things and looking after these things. So uh, moving into the sermon this morning, if you haven't noticed some strange and unusual things are happening, right? Certainly the pandemic is strange and unusual, Ben. It's not every day that everybody walks around wearing masks. We don't like them, I don't. But we do it to protect others, right? People are social distancing in the church. We got the doors wide open even though it's a little cool outside. The reason being the more fresh air you have, the less likelihood that the virus can, can affect you. So it's strange and unusual times. Other unusual things are happening. The economy for many people uh, is affecting pe uh, several people. People are, are, many people are without jobs. Their income is, is uh, affected. Uh, I do know some people who've lost their jobs and it's really a, a serious situation. So these are things I think we need to be uh, uh, aware of and we need to be praying for people. Uh, as a reminder, uh, we have had a few individuals come to us who needed food, people in our congregation. Don't be afraid to ask. We have a lot of food in our pantry right now. We've been encouraging people to bring food, and we encourage you to continue to bring food. Don't be ashamed to ask for help. That's why we're here. God is, we as Christians, because we love you and want to help you, we certainly want to help you out. If any of you all need help in any other way, um, please let us know. Uh, I had a call last week and this week from an individual who's experiencing a lot of depression and they're feeling a lot of stress. And so I've put them in touch with someone who could speak with them and help them. And so we need to, to lift one another up and reach out to each other. Um, our senior citizens, our elderly in particular, we need to, to look after them and look, look out after them. It's affecting everyone. Rebecca looked at me very solemnly a couple of days ago. She says, Jeff, I'm really tired of COVID-19. And I said, you got it, sister, I am too. We want to go out and we want to go camping. We want to go you know, shopping. We want to do all of those things. And things are starting to open back up and we're able to do more of that. But it does affect us, doesn't it? And so, you know, these are serious times. And it affects relationships. In the news I'm hearing, there's a lot of, of challenges in families. Lots of times families are people who have left the nest. They're coming back to the nest, right? There are a lot of young couples who have moved out and now they're moving back in with their parents because they've lost their jobs or they were supposed to be away at college. I've got a neighbor just down the street. I don't know him personally, but he's got at least five college kids <laughs> that he has in his home. And um, they're a home, you know, they're, they're, uh, they left, the, the colleges and universities were closed back in March. Nanny, and you know, they're, they're all of them at home packed into the house. And so these things create stresses and challenges. We as Christians, as individuals, sometimes because we're cooped up, we have some challenges as well. So I would just like to share today some thoughts on the family of God and um, from the Bible, some practical advice for all of us in dealing with this, in dealing with this uh, pandemic and dealing with this virus. So there's a number of ways, a number of approaches. One approach we could take is looking at physical health. Let me ask you all a question. 
Raise your hand if you believe that Seventh-day Adventists have something good to say about physical health. Uh, yeah, everybody raises their hand. We have a lot to say about that, don't we? This church, we have put on stress seminars in the past. We put on cooking classes in the past. We have put on stop smoking programs. You name it, we've done it. You know, divorce care, all of those programs. And these things we should be doing, reaching out to our community within our church community and outside the community. And we've gotten good results from those with those outreaches. These programs are designed to meet people's needs. And people are feeling a need for help. We have a number of people in our community that are diabetic, for example, that have similar kinds of health issues, high blood pressure, those kinds of things. We put on last year a Diabetes Undone program. We had, and it was successful, we have people who, um, we have people that uh, have had uh, financial stress, money stress, they wanted to know better how to handle their money. And we have uh, put on, this past year, we put on a program on uh, dealing with, uh, what was the name of that program? Financial University, I believe it was what it was called. Um, David, Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey put that program on. We brought it here by video. We had a lot of people, Nathan, from the community come and attend that program. So th these are some things that we have knowledge on. But we are concerned that leaders, the uh, elders, we're concerned about our church family, people in our congregation, as well as the people out there. So this information is designed for you. Some of this is, I say most of this is common sense. But listen carefully. If you're a young couple just getting married, God's advice right at the beginning, God's advice is establish your own private home. It says in Genesis 2, 24, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It says leave his father and mother, establish their own home. God's principle is that married couples should move out of their parents' homes and establish their own, even if finances require something modest even if it's just a one-room apartment. Many marriages would be improved if this principle were followed. Well, because of the virus, sometimes families have to come back together under one roof. Marva is taking care of her mom. She's under the same roof with her mother. That can, provide, can, can, can create some challenges. You know, we took care of, of uh, my mother-in-law for several years and, and uh, it, cre it can create some challenges. And I think we are obliged to take care of our parents as they get older in those, those circumstances. But if you're younger, if you can move out, establish your own home, it makes for less stress within the family. If you're a couple, regardless of your age, listen carefully, continue your courtship. Above all things, the Apostle Peter says, 1 Peter 4, verse 8, above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. I know that in families sometimes there's some stresses and some strains, some shouting and some screaming. At least it happened in my family. We all kind of were close together at age. There were four of us kids, and we were teens. I wouldn't want to live under the same roof with us. We were, there was a lot of arguing. There was some pushing and shoving and those kinds of things. But uh, we should have fervent love one for another. It says in Romans 12 and verse 10, be kindly affection one to another and honor giving preference to one another. Now these principles, Betty, can apply not just to married couples, but to anyone within our church family. Now I'm going to be honest with you folks. I've seen some, some uh, hair pulling in our church before and uh, years ago. Uh, sometimes uh, We've had board meetings, not, not in the recent years, but I've seen a few board meetings where we've come away from those board meetings and, and you just wonder, you know, are we Christians or not? People get to, get to hollering at one another and, uh, you know, I think it's okay to have disagreements, but you know, when we have a Bible study with a group of people, we say it's okay to disagree, but it's not okay to be disagreeable. Does that make sense? It's okay to disagree, Carl, but don't be disagreeable, right? We have a right to our opinions. We do. In this democracy, we do. 
And we have a right to state what we believe. But we're not, we don't have a right to be disagreeable, to harm people physically or with our words or emotionally. Be kindly affectionate one to another and, uh, and honor giving preference to one another, Paul says in Romans 12, verse 10. By the way, Paul was writing this to a church. And if you read the book of Romans, you can see that there were stresses and strains within the church. God wants us to get along one another, to lift up one another, to encourage one another. Continue or revive your courtship into your married life. Successful marriages don't just happen, they must be developed. Don't take one another for granted or the resulting monotony could harm your marriage. Keep your love for one another growing, one another for growing by expressing it to each other. Otherwise, love might fade away. Anybody here ever heard of Mark Finley, the evangelist Mark Finley? Several years ago, he did an evangelistic crusade via satellite. He helped to pioneer satellite evangelism. He was one of the first to stand in front of a camera, and the camera just sent the message up to a satellite, and then it was shown around the world. There were people that were in Africa, South America, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, here in the U.S. that were baptized as a result of that outreach. Amen? He said something in one of those that was very profound. I'm going to share it with you. He said something that was very important. Expression deepens impression. Say it with me. Expression deepens impression. If you're a married couple, whether you're newlywed or whether you've been married for 50 years, whether you got brunette hair or lots of gray hair, expression deepens impression. If you express love and affirmation to your spouse, to your children, it deepens the impression on your own heart. If you, express, if you express disfavor, disharmony, hatred, anger to your family member, to your spouse, to your children, it deepens the impression on your own heart. Listen to me. Church board members, church family, if you express positive things, affirmative things to the church family members, it deepens the impression. If you express negative things, it deepens the impression in your own heart. A case begins to be built. You build a case against someone or for someone. You ever heard a politician, don't answer this question, you ever heard a politician put down another politician? I doubt if you've heard that recently. They're building a case. They start off by saying this, and then they say this, and then they say this, and then they say this. And it's just all this negative stuff. And of course, we never hear that on the airwaves, right? This time of the year. Those political advertisements, we love to hear them. I'm being a little bit facetious. Married couples should spend as much time with each other as they possibly can. As they grow older, especially, where to spend time with one another. I'm glad to see the brother and sisters here putting their arms around each other. We should do that. Remember that God joined you together in marriage. For this reason, Jesus says in Matthew 19, red letter edition of the Bible, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. By the way, he's quoting from Genesis chapter 2. Jesus believed in the Bible. He believed in the Old Testament. I heard somebody the other day say, well, I'm a New Testament Christian. I don't believe in the Old Testament. Jesus quoted frequently from the Old Testament. And here he's quoting from Genesis 2, here in Matthew 19. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man... Let no man, let no woman put asunder. What God has joined together, they become one flesh. By the way, the marriage was designed for many reasons, obviously for the growth of the human race, right? 
Did y'all know it says in the book of Isaiah that God created this earth to be inhabited? He wants it to be inhabited with people like you and me. That's his design, that's his desire, and it will be, okay? It will be. But one of the reasons God created man and woman He wanted the relationship between them to be like the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God says, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Husband and wife are to be one flesh. There may be some here who are struggling with their marriage. There may be some here who are angry with a spouse or angry with a child. And I understand that because that happens because we are human. I'm not making an excuse, but we are human. All have sinned and, and fallen short of the glory of God. But God wants us to quickly get past that. He says, let no man put asunder. Don't start thinking divorce. That's not God's ideal. Now, I know there's some here who have been divorced. There are. There are circumstances that are really hard to understand or perplexing. I spoke with someone just this week who told me about his wife leaving him. And it broke my heart because the last time I had seen him and had conversation with him, evidently he and his wife were happily married. No more. It hurts. By the way, it, it hurts the children as well, right? It does. Let me back up and say something you all know. The family unit husbands and wives and children, is the bedrock of society. Now, I heard somebody the other day say that society is just all messed up. And I agreed with them. Society is all messed up. Why do you think society is all messed up? Because families, to a large degree, are all messed up. They are. They're not following God's ideal for them. And if you have not followed or follow God's ideal, there's hope for you. Listen carefully as we go forward. By the way, no one here is to be condemned because all of us have made mistakes. Amen? We've all made mistakes. God loves you. Guard your thoughts. It says in Proverbs 23, verse 7, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So as you think, so you are. You tell me what a man is thinking, I'll tell you who he is or what he is. Does that make sense? So what the Bible says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. It says, Exodus 20, verse 17, guarding your thoughts, husbands and wives, family members, church family members, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you shall not look at another woman lustfully. Goes both ways, doesn't it? Women, you're not to look at another man lustfully. We've all done it. I'm not making an excuse for it, but it's sin. And it's breaking the seventh commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. By the way, that's the ninth commandment. Seventh commandment and the ninth commandment have to do with coveting someone else that doesn't belong to us. We're not to do it. Many marriages end up on the rocks because someone covets someone else that doesn't belong to them. It's against the law, God's moral law. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Proverbs 4, 23. Keep your heart. How do you keep your heart? Studying God's word, praying, affirming your spouse. If your spouse makes a mistake and they will, forgive them. Forgive them in your heart. Don't harp on it. I'm going to use a word that's often used with women, and I apologize ahead of time but it can be used for men as well. Don't nag. Anybody here know what the word nag means? We used to have a pastor who was a member of the, he was the pastor of this church and he was a little bit countryfied. His wife would, would, would say something to him and he would look at her and he'd go, oh, nag, 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 nag. Y'all probably know who I'm talking about. She was a saint and let me tell you, the wrong kind of thinking can profoundly harm your marriage. The devil will tempt you with thoughts like, our marriage was a mistake. She doesn't understand me. I can't take much of this anymore. 
We could always divorce if necessary. I'll go home to mother. I saw him smiling at another woman. This kind of thinking is dangerous because your thoughts ultimately govern your actions. Avoid seeing, saying, reading, or hearing anything, and that goes with pornography, which is rampant these days, in churches and outside of churches. Avoid seeing, saying, reading, or hearing anything that or associate with anyone who suggests being unfaithful. Sometimes a woman has been abused by a man I'm just using this as an example. And she'll go and speak to her friend. And her friend will encourage her in a direction which may not be the right direction. Now, if someone's suffering from physical abuse or emotional abuse from another spouse, I do think counseling is appropriate. Uh, speaking to a pastor or to a marriage counselor, I definitely think is appropriate. And I will say this. If a woman, and more often than not, a woman is being physically abused by a man, separate. Don't leave yourself in harm's way. I think everyone here knows of someone who has had that kind of experience. Here's some good counsel for all of us, and I need to hasten. Never go to bed angry with one another. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, it says in Ephesians 4, 26. Confess your trespasses one to another, it says in James 5, 16. Forgetting those things which are behind, Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3 and verse 13. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forget those things which are behind. Sometimes it's hard to forget, but just don't dwell on the past. Keep moving forward. Those of you who have been divorced, those of you who have experienced of emotional pain from, or spousal abuse of some kind. You can't forget. But you know, every day is a new day. Make that choice to serve Jesus. Keep looking up. Jesus says, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith. Keep your eyes on him. Time heals, by the way. As time goes by, by the grace of God, as you continue to focus on Jesus, claiming his promises, he will heal you. Carl did a good job with scripture reading this morning, didn't he? Our scripture reading was Ephesians 4.32. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Some adults sitting here today may think that's just a children's memory verse. That verse is especially for children, but it's especially, it's especially Ron, who am I for adults as well, isn't it? Be ye kind one to another. Tenderhearted. What does it mean to be tenderhearted? Soft heart. Forgiving one another. You ever been so angry at your spouse you just wanted to, you just wanted to, you just wanted to. Tenderhearted. Tenderhearted. And that's born from above. That is born from above. Be big enough to forgive and say, I'm sorry. I remember years ago, Rebecca and I were a young married couple. We had a, a lover's quarrel over something really stupid. I was too proud to say I was sorry. After about an hour or so, she came up to me and told me that she was sorry. And that melted my heart, and I said, I'm sorry to you too, for you too. So it works. By the way, in the, uh, the Lord's Prayer, it says we are to forgive one another. Forgiving is hard to do because it doesn't come natural. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? The, the heart is naturally not soft. That's why we need the Holy Spirit and pray for the Holy Spirit to be in the center of our families. I need to speed up. Keep Christ in the center of your home. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. You're going to be laboring in vain to keep your marriage together, to keep your family together, your house together, unless the Lord is in the center of it. Psalm 127, verse 1. And all your ways acknowledge him. He'll direct your paths. We, that's a 
scripture song. We say it all the time, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Diplomacy, strategy, those kinds of things, they have their place. What we need most in our families is Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Pray together as spouses. Pray together as family members. I'm glad we've got a praying church. I'm thankful for prayer meeting. And you know what? We want our prayer meeting to grow. We want people to join us. We need to be praying together. Husbands and wives need to pray together, not just at meal times, although that's important. Watch and pray, Jesus says, lest you enter into temptation. He said that to Peter. Pray for one another, James 5 and verse 16. Agree that divorce is not the answer. While God is joined together, let no man separate. Matthew 19, 6. Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Matthew 19, 9. It, that deserves an, uh, uh, just a couple of seconds. Some of you here probably have had that experience. We serve a God who loves to forgive. If anybody here has had that experience, I would really encourage you just to go to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Ask for forgiveness, and he will. He will forgive you. Just as he said to the woman who had been caught in adultery, where are these thine accusers? They weren't there. They had walked away because Jesus had written their sins in the sand. He told her to go and sin no more. Amen? He was saying that to me and to you. Go and sin no more. Whether it's adultery or something else, God is there to forgive us. He doesn't condone the sin. He says, go and sin no more. But if you've fallen into that trap, as many people have, ask him to forgive you and go and sin no more. The Bible says that the ties of marriage are meant to be unbreakable. Divorce is allowable only in cases of adultery. But even then, it's not demanded. Forgiveness is always better than divorce, even in the case of unfaithfulness. That's hard. There have been cases where a man has stepped out on his wife or vice versa. And the spouse who was wronged forgave them. They stuck together. It's hard. You have the right to divorce in that instance. But it's not required. You following what I'm saying? Keep the family circle closed tightly. Private family matters should never be sh shared with others outside your home, not even your parents. A person outside the marriage, a person outside the marriage to sympathize with or listen to complaints can be used by the devil to estrange the hearts of a husband and wife. Solve your private home problems privately. Now, there are some circumstances that require counseling. That's why we have pastors. That's why we have marriage counselors. God describes love. Make it your daily goal to measure up to it. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. By the way, we, we were like many, many other couples when Rebecca and I got married 36 or 7 years ago. I'm glad she's not here. She, she had a bout of asthma and stayed home today. She'll listen to this later, though. I'll hear about it. Our marriage, our marriage vows were for, from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not, is not provoked. Love bears all things. Rejoices in the truth. Love believes all things. Hopes all things. That's God's ideal for us. Paul was writing this to the Corinthians, and the Corinthians were Greeks, and the Greeks had multiple gods, and they believed in, in multiple marriages and multiple relationships. 
And Paul wrote some of his toughest letters in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. You know when a church has some challenges when Paul had to write two letters to them, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. But throughout all of that, you can see that there's love. And the great love chapter is found in the middle of the book of 1 Corinthians, the, the letter to the Corinthians. Remember that criticism and nagging is not love. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. I wonder why Paul wrote that. Colossians chapter 3, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. Does it go both ways? Women? Women, love your husbands and don't be bitter towards them. You may have some disagreements. But I say the remedy is spending time on your knees and spending time in God's word. Now Solomon had hundreds of wives. Listen to what Solomon said. Better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. <laughs> a continual dripping on a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Solomon was speaking from experience because he made the grave, almost fatal mistake of having too many wives. Well, the reason I say almost fatal is because he repented. He turned away from all of that. He realized that these women were turning him to idolatry, and he turned away from the true and the living God. And again, this goes both ways. Stop criticizing, stop nagging. Do not overdo. Be temperate at everything. I'm on the home stretch, almost done. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 25. Love does not seek its own, its own, it says in 1 Corinthians 13. Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, it says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. I discipline my body. This is a very interesting passage. I encourage you all to, to look this up. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Paul decided he was not going to let his body rule him, his desires. He's not going to let his desires rule him. He was letting God's word rule him. Overdoing will ruin your marriage. Too much work and lack of rest, proper food, exercise can lead to a person to be critical, intolerant, and negative. The Bible also recommends a temperate sex life. We're not to treat one another as animals. I'm not going to go any further than that. Hopefully you all understand that. But the Bible talks about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 3 through 6, there is very specific counsel on that topic. God wants us to love one another, marry couples to come together, to have children, to enjoy sex. It's important. It's important to relationships. It can be overdone and underdone. Seek counsel in God's Word. Seek counsel in the spirit of prophecy. By the way, Doug Batcher has written a book on adultery and remarriage. If any of you all have any questions about that or concerns about that, you can go to amazingfacts.org. It's a great book. And also there's counsel on what we're talking about here. Respect each other's personal rights. Men, you really don't have a right to go through your, your wife's purse unless you ask her to, ask permission. Ladies, don't go rooting around in your husband's wallet, although I, there's nothing in mine, so uh, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a big deal. Each spouse has a, spouse has a God-given right to certain personal privacies. Do not tamper with, with each other's personal email and private property unless given permission. Doug Batcher gave some good advice. He said, I heard him say this not too long ago. He's given his wife the passwords to all of his computer stuff so that she can go in and see that he's not looking at something inappropriate. You following what I'm saying? Raise your hand if you understand what I'm saying. These are safeguards to marriages. Be clean, modest, orderly, and dutiful. God has given you responsibilities in the family and the church family as well. 
Do what God has asked you to do. Take care of your spouse. Husbands and wives, take care of each other. Take care of those precious kids that you brought into the world. You have a responsibility to help see them into heaven. Amen? Amen. Let all things be done decently in order, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's strong language. In other words, a husband needs to take care of his family. He needs to work. Wives, too. Now, sometimes there are, there are health reasons. Sometimes there may be some mental reasons where that can be a challenge. But God has an answer for all of these things. Back to where we started. Determined to speak softly and kindly to one another. Where is Marva? Last Sabbath, Marva and I were at a uh, funeral at 9 a.m. And uh, Maxine, from over at the the uh, Rio Rancho Church, passed away, and her funeral was there. Several people from several churches were there. Marva was there to sing, and we appreciated that song. Um, but there was a woman who spoke, who stood up and spoke and gave a little testimony. And she mentioned that Maxine was very quiet. And Maxine was a very quiet lady. And you had to listen carefully to hear what she had to say. And the woman who was giving this testimony, she said, I came from a loud family. And she says, I am a very loud person. And I had to chuckle. I think everybody in there chuckled. And I think it's okay if you're in a loud family, it's okay to have a loud family. But we're not to be shouting at one another. We're to be softly and kindly speaking to one another. Speak softly and kindly to your spouse, even in disputes. You're gonna have disagreements. You're two individuals. It's natural to have disagreements, but it's how you deal with them, right? Young or old. Do you think that God the Father hollered at Jesus? Do you think that Jesus ever hollered at God the Father? I don't think so. They were one in thought, one in beliefs. Husbands and wives are supposed to be one. One. The last thing I'll mention is to be reasonable in money matters. The most reason, popular reason why people say they're divorced is one spouse has been abusing the pocketbook. Be careful how you spend money. If it's a large expense, there should be a discussion between the two and you should come to agreement. There have been a couple of times when I wanted to buy something, Rebecca and I talked it over. She says, I don't think you should do it. Even though it hurt my feelings a little bit, I didn't do it. And guess what? A week or two later, I was glad I didn't. Does that make sense? And vice versa. Particularly if it's a major expense, we should talk it together. Both women and men should have some personal money to spend on any way that they please. We're not to lord it over each other. The woman is not to slave to the man and vice versa. We're to be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. God has an ideal for us. He has an ideal for the church family and for each one of our families during these very stressful times. COVID-19, we're all kind of squashed together. Kids that were off and away are now back at home. Some of the states opened up and they had to close back again because of the virus. Some of the kids went to university, they had to come back because the university had to close. Now they're sitting at home again, sitting at the dining room table, maybe being argumentative. We need to pray for one another, encourage one another, and lift one another up. If Jesus is in the center of our lives, if Jesus is in the center of our homes, he's going to make everything all right. I remember as a child, something happened. I don't remember exactly what it was. It broke my heart, and I was weeping. And I remember my parents came up to me and picked me up and said, it's going to be all right. And I want to leave you all with that thought. You may be going through some challenges in your family life. But with Jesus, it's going to be all right. Amen? Do we have a closing song? Closing music?
just Bethany yet that when I'm done, okay. What do you say we stand together and pray and then we're gonna dismiss by rows. We've got a couple of strong, handsome young men standing in the back, their wives love them and think they're wonderful. They're standing back there and they're going to miss us by rows, starting in the back and then towards the front, we will leave. The reason we're doing that, we don't want people to bunch up at the, at the door because we're trying to, to minimize contact with one another. So I'm gonna pray and the, these gentlemen are going to start dismissing us. So let's, and Bethany will play the piano. Thanks everybody for being patient with me. Uh, hope you all learned something I did in preparing this. God is good, amen? Amen, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for families. You invented us. The family is an invention of God. It's his desire for the family to be the bedrock of society. As we are close to you, as we witness for you to other families, the people we interact with, boy, that would just solve most of the problems in this world. Help us to be loving, kind, compassionate with one another, and help us to f learn to forgive one another. Forgiveness is the, one of the best remedies and it solves and covers a multitude of problems. Lord, we believe it's gonna be all right with you. And with this COVID-19 going on, all these fires out on the West Coast, all these struggles and problems we have with the environment and this, that, and the other, we're trusting you, Lord. It is going to be all right. We thank you, hear our prayer, save us to the uttermost. Go before us, In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.